Gentlemen, thank you very much for your time today. Uh, you're very welcome. Um, I would like to start, we'll get into the detail of some of the, um, some of the restructures, but I, I would just like to recognize the uh, improvement in the underlying performance of the bank. Obviously, taking over permanent TSB in the state it was in is a very difficult job, so I just want to recognize there are some very um, uh, welcome figures coming through at a macro level on the performance of the bank. Thank you. Can I talk about, I'd like to talk about the, um, the legal proceedings. Can I ask, does the bank have an estimate? I know various figures have been bandied around the committee room today. Does permanent TSB have an estimate for the likely number of repossessions that are going to occur through this process? So I think we, we can extrapolate from the figures that you have here um, what that figure might be. So if, if you, Deputy, look at the figures at the top of the template, um, and you look to the fact that to date, for every four uh, cases we've looked at, three are restructured, like a split mortgage, a part CNI, and one is legal. You could extrapolate a figure. But to the point I made earlier, we have to be very cautious to link that figure directly to repossessions because there's significant engagement post the legal process. So I, I would be cautious to, to be specific about a, a figure. I think over time, cumulatively, it is, it is likely to be a low single-digit figure in, in the thousands, uh, but, but a relatively low single-digit figure. So somewhere, say, between two and 4,000? In that range. Okay, thank you. Maybe, maybe not as high. Okay, and would you expect to see a, a mix of that between buy-to-let and residential family home? We would, yes. Yeah, okay. Have you an idea of the mix? Are we looking at 50-50 or are we looking at a very much skewed in, in one of those There's, there's probably, there, there, there will be a bias towards buy-to-let. A bias towards yeah. buy-to-let, okay, thank you. Um, it's already been mentioned, one of the things that really jumped out at me from the figures you provided was that the number of court proceedings initiated in the last three months has been about 1,500. Um, which is about 23 a day, 23 per working day. So a very, very serious amount of activity. Um, why have we seen such a big jump? What has changed within the bank to drive this very, very serious growth in court proceedings initiated? So I'd say two things. The, the figure is from a very, very low base relative to, to other banks. Um, and I re reiterate the point I made that um, I suppose wh wh when you have to work at pace through the number of um, distressed accounts uh, as we have had to, you have to make choices about what clusters or groups of customers you work with first. And we'll we allocate our resources. Yes, yeah, exactly. So we worked primarily in the early days with customers that we felt were, would be successful in terms of our assessment for split mortgages and part capital and interest. And in recent months, we've worked um, uh, to a greater extent with customers that to date have not been cooperating. So that explains the increase from a very low base, but you shouldn't extrapolate that that increase in that quarter uh, will continue. Let me, so, sorry, Deputy, let me uh, perhaps just uh, help there. Uh, we, we were quite slow out the traps, as you know, and that was a conscious choice because we wanted to do, I think, as best data analytics as we could to find the right cohorts of customers to try and get them the right treatments. And so uh, at the end of the day, what we're trying to bring is, is certainty to people as quickly as we can. And so uh, once we'd found the right cohorts through the data analytics, we allocated our resources against that particular group of customers. And I, I, I'd like to think that we have give or take got that right when you look at the number of, of non-closure treatments that we've put in place. We're now moving into what our data would show us is that uh, is, it, it, it are the cohort of customers who uh, are, are going to perhaps be more difficult for us to engage with. And so, so can you, do, on the basis that you have the analytics, can you tell the committee a little bit more about who, who these people are? So let's say there's 1,500. The number hopefully is not going to continue at the same level. Yeah. Are these um, people who are refusing to cooperate, who are refusing to engage, are they people who actually are engaging but they simply don't have the money to pay the mortgage? Can you just t tell us about who these people are now that you've, you've done the analysis to find yeah, sure. them? 
yeah. So, so it's a combination of, of, of all of those categories. It's people who will not answer the phone or who will not answer the door or who will not engage in any way. It's people who will make commitments to come to our branch to complete an SFS form who uh, will agree the appointment day and date and time and, and subsequently won't turn up. Um, it's people who will come to the branch and do all of that and make a commitment to provide the supporting documentation and who subsequently won't. Um, and it's people beyond that point who will make a commitment to contribute to their debt, but the level of contribution will be very low or not maintained. So generally, that, that, is, um, that is the journey of the, the uh, non-cooperating customer. Uh, pe people sometimes think that it, it simply means refusal to, to discuss or talk, but, but it's a little more than that. Okay. I think the point of principle is that uh, we, we think we have a, a treatment tree uh, that, that follows a, a logic, mm -hmm. and that uh, we are happy to, in, to talk with any customer at any point in time if they'll engage with us to try and get them in a treatment here, because that's, that's the right thing for everybody. Okay. Anyone who's down in a closure, sadly, we think we can look you in the eye this morning and say that uh, it, it's not through us just sending out mass legal letters. It's, it's us having followed a process. And sadly, the numbers are the numbers. Well, on that then, I would very much like to echo what the chairman said earlier on around the residual debt. So I don't have a problem with people who are refusing to engage with the bank having legal proceedings initiated against them. If you've made every reasonable effort and they refuse to engage with you, well, then so be it. Um, however, sadly, there are many families out there who I'm sure are engaging and simply through unemployment or through pay cuts or whatever it is, they no longer have the money to service uh, the mortgage and maybe the split doesn't work and maybe inevitably there is simply no remedial action that can be taken. Um, what I was very disappointed to hear was that there isn't a policy in place for the residual debt and I think Mr. Masding, the, the phrase you used was we don't go after all of the debt all of the time. That's no use to a family who's trying to resuscitate themselves financially, right? And can they get another mortgage? Well, the first thing the, the, a new lender will say is, well, you still owe permanent TSB 60 grand. Now, they may not have asked you to pay it back to them yet, but you owe it to them, and presumably it's still tipping away on interest. If someone wants to set up a new business, again, it'll be the first thing that's seen. So. I would very much like when you're back before the committee in three months time or whatever it is to hear that a policy has been put in place, that it's dealt with and it's closed off. And I'm not suggesting that all residual debt in all cases has to be completely written off. Um, but I am suggesting that there needs to be finality given so that people can get on with their lives. So I would very much like to see that. Do you think that is something that we might be able to see when you appear before the committee again? Uh, Deputy, um, as we learn, as we go through the thousands of cases, uh, we recognise that our assisted voluntary sale product, as it stands today, uh, needs to be tweaked. Uh, and uh, I can assure you that when we're back here in uh, six months' time, that uh, we'll, um, uh, we will be able to give you better data points. And I'd hope we could look you in the eye and say that we're, we've learned and we're doing uh, uh, we have an assisted voluntary sale product that, that, that's the next generation, if I could call it that. Thank you. Chair, uh, you got plenty. Great, thanks. Um, can I ask, one of the uh, complaints that we heard, we had the mortgage holder support groups in, FLAC, MAPS, Mortgage Holders, Phoenix Project, New Beginning, etc., last week. And one of the things we heard consistently was that mortgage holders, when they're made an offer, it, they are not, in most cases, being offered choices and they're not being offered an explanation as to why a particular offer is being made. Can I ask what the case for permanent TSB is? So specifically two questions. Is it the case that you write to somebody and say, the offer we are making to you, for example, is a split mortgage with 20% on the shelf, come and talk to us? Or do you write and say, look, actually, we think a reduced interest payment or a split might work here are the advantages and disadvantages of both. Here's why we are offering you these. Uh, come and talk to us. So in terms of the customer treatments, we recommend one treatment and we provide significant detail on that treatment. So let's say, for example, the split mortgage. We then outline the other treatments that we considered but were discounted. Sorry, Mr. Can I just check? So I, I know there's a lot of detail provided, yes. but the detail I tend to see is detail, technical detail about the offer. <laughs> 
Is there included in that detail an explanation for why, in your case, a split mortgage has been provided? There, there is, um, but, but as I say, the focus is on the recommendation, which in this example is split mortgage, um, and we refer in passing to the other um, options that we considered but did not recommend. Secondly, um, once that letter is then posted, we have a team of customer care staff, 35 staff, um, who follow up all those letters and speak to the customer um, post receipt of the documentation to ensure that they receive the documentation and that they understand the detail and they can answer one-to-one um, -one by phone any queries that the customer may have. Uh, we also, at that point in time... I think it's important to say that, uh, as far as I'm aware, the other banks may have caught up now, but as far as I'm aware, we were the only institution that, that did that insofar as we broke the value chain down into different components. And uh, the customer care team, certainly from my experience of doing this in other jurisdictions, is, is a very important part because um, obviously one needs a letter for an audit trail, but a letter must be complemented by uh, a human interaction. and. Uh, uh, that's why we built the team. Agreed. I, I'd add one final point that's important. We also will contribute €250 Euro to each customer who has received one of these long-term offers from us to go meet an independent advisor to take advice, um, independent of our customer care team or um, our management team in terms of the offer and the alternatives. Thank you. Um, I, one of the offerings, I, I want to bring two things together, one which the Chairman has touched on, which is what happens at retirement. So the split mortgage I accept can work. I accept there is a real hit taken by the bank and there's a real financial gain to the, to, to the borrower. Where it falls down is what happens on retirement. Right? Now, I have publicly advocated for a debt for equity solution, initiating right at the restructure, but certainly one place which, is, which uh, it can be used at and which AIB is looking at is at retirement, you turn the split mortgage into a debt for equity. And therefore, Mr. O'Sullivan, your concern, I think reasonable concern that uh, household income halves approximately on retirement, there's a concern around affordability. Debt for equity obviously gets rid of all of that risk. It de-risks the product completely. Um, and it maintains the asset position for the bank because you're simply converting part of the mortgage into equity in the house. Is that something that permanent TSB has considered? Is it something that permanent TSB will consider? Uh, Deputy, um, we we started a long way behind everyone else in terms of our home loan treatment, so we're, we're working through and we're learning. And uh, eventually there'll be different challenges and different cohorts that we're going to have to find a solution for. So could I give you assurance on two things uh, as examples? Uh, assisted voluntary sale, we need to work on and uh, if you'll allow me to take away the retirement debt for equity concept, um, I, I give you my word that we will put that into the, uh, into, the, into the science and see if we can make it work. Thank you. Well, while we're on a roll then, Mr. Mazin, can I ask you also, just to take away the debt for equity product generally, I think it makes an awful lot of sense at retirement, but as I've, I've advocated publicly before, actually I think it's a, it's a, it is part of the answer. Uh, I think it works in ways that debt write-downs don't. Um, certainly there was a lot of pushback from people around the publicized AIB debt write-down where people said, well, what about me, right? Um, now, I think the main issue is not people saying, what about me? I think the main issue, which is a legitimate one, is um, that nobody profits from a debt write-down. And certainly a debt for equity product rather than a debt write-down sorts that out because essentially there's no way to profit. So Mr. Masling, maybe uh, you would add into the hopper a more general debt for equity product, which certainly I believe would help. I believe it would maintain the health of the balance sheet of permanent TSB and the other banks. And critically, I believe that it would return the individual or the family to a normal life whilst not having the fear of the bank knocking on their door every three years and saying, hey, turns out you got a pay rise, turns out you got a bonus. We want some of that. So it allows the family, it, it, it provides an awful lot more clarity and I think incentivizes good economic behavior for an awful lot of people in the country. Uh, I assure you we'll take the principle of, of debt for equity away, Deputy. Thank you, uh, Mr. Masling. The final question then is on mortgage to rent. Mortgage to rent is one of these things that clearly isn't working. And I was uh, disappointed to see that 
uh, Furman and CSB didn't have any mortgage to rent, nor do Bank of Ireland or Ulster Bank. Um, now, Mr. O'Sullivan, you mentioned earlier on that clearly the levels are wrong uh, for Dublin, but there's got to be more to it than that. Now, I'm aware, and I'm not going to get into the specifics of the case, but I, I'm aware of a case the firm and TSB did get right to the end of on mortgage to rent, and it was agreed with one of the housing authorities, and at the end there was a dispute on the sales price of permanent TSB, which is their right, walked away and said, no, we're not selling it for that amount. What needs to be done to the mortgage to rent scheme to make it work, in your opinion? So I think a couple of things. I think the, the process is unnecessarily cumbersome. So a, a lean Six Sigma, if you're familiar with the, the concept type uh, exercise, needs to be uh, completed so that all these double touch points and this lack of joined up thinking is, is reviewed and improved. Um, at the core though is, is the issue that you mentioned around valuations. And so the bank um, will tend to look to the open market valuation, which is, is the norm in banking to establish the value of the property and the price that the bank uh, expects to receive for the property. Um, and on the other side, the housing association or bodies look more to the valuation based on rental income. And those two differ, the open market value and, and uh, a basis of rental income. And it's that delta or gap that causes a problem because it usually means that the bank will receive less than it might have anticipated for the property. And as a consequence, that means that the subsequent shortfall for the borrower, if one arises, um, is larger. And um, that also brings, brings up a, a point that the banks need to consider in terms of the shortfall. So, so there are a number of issues. You, you need a lot of uh, ducks to be lined up to enable you to get MTR uh, case across the line. And that is unfortunate because I do feel that it is a proposition that has value. Yeah. And we, we have a pipeline of 100, 150 customers that we think are appropriate for this solution. And they're happy uh, by and large, not all, but, but are happy by and large that this this would be the sustainable solution for them. Um, but, but it's difficult to get there. Everyone is trying their best, by the way. I'm not in any way um, saying otherwise, but I think we just need to, to, to work collaboratively with different parts of the, the system. I think, I think you hit the nail on the head insofar as there's probably two questions. It, it, is it a product that broadly we'd like on the shelf? The answer is yes. Is it a product that we can make work unilaterally? No. And it's probably a system or a policy question where we just need some help to, to make it work. 